Chapter 1 Chapter 1 Alexander had opened his eyes and saw nothing but a ceiling before he sat up, holding his head with one hand because it was hurting slightly. After sitting up, Alexander looked around to try and get a clue as to where he was at. But all he saw was a hallway that had wires with electric sparks coming out of it. He didn't remember him being anywhere that looked like this. All around him, it looked foreign and like it was not man-made. After looking around, he tried to stand up, but he felt a heavy pressure that made him fall back down to the ground. It was as if gravity was forcing him to stay down and not get up. He tried to get up again, but once again he fell down to the ground. But Alexander wasn't one to give up easily, and he kept trying to stand up, no matter how hard it was for him. While it was painful to keep falling down, he still kept trying, and eventually, after multiple tries, he was finally able to stand up without falling down. The pain from falling down so many times on the hard metal floor was a lot to deal with, but as long as he can figure out where he is at, he can handle it. Now that Alexander is able to walk, he started walking down the hallway that he had seen earlier, avoiding the electric wires that probably would shock him to death if he got touched by them. He proceeded down the hallway that had various rooms. He checked each of the rooms, which some of them had some strange computers, which he noticed looked familiar to some he had seen in one of his favorite series, Star Wars. In one of the rooms, which looked like a command room of sorts, Alexander walked up to one of the strange computers in the room and seen and red button flashing. Now, a normal person who was in this situation wouldn't even think to press the button, nor would they have investigated this room. But Alexander, well, he was not a normal person, and for some reason, he felt that button was calling to him or something, which was a little weird. But that wasn't even the weirdest thing, since after a few seconds, his hand started moving on its own towards the button. He tried to resist by using his other hand to stop it, but it was useless. His hand kept moving forward as it was being drawn towards the button. Alexander was panicking right now, since nothing will come good from him pressing the button, especially if his body is being drawn to it. As his hand got closer to the button, Alexander closed his eyes to prepare for what was about to happen. As his hand pressed the button, the sound of something powering up could be heard from around Alexander. But he felt no pain, nor did anything bad happen. So Alexander opened his eyes. All around the room, all the computers were lighting up, so Alexander had peeked his head outside the room door, and he had seen that some rooms which were previously dark now had light. Alexander looked at his hand. I guess that did nothing besides restore the power to this place, but it was weird. It was like my body just moved on its own. Alexander wondered just what that mysterious power was. He wasn't going to think about it for too long, since if he didn't know what it was, then how was thinking about it going to help him know more? So he turned around and started walking over to all of the computers that were now active to investigate. But as he was walking towards the computers, he heard a voice in his head. Do you want power? The voice sounded very dark and had surprised Alexander, causing him to stop walking and look around him to find the source of the voice. Do you want to make other bow to you? The voice had once again spoke, saying something different this time. Alexander didn't know where the voice was coming from, but he decided to answer by saying no. The voice had then started laughing manically. Lies. Everybody has a desire for power, no matter who they are. People crave power over everything else. Power will only get you so far, and it comes at a cost for something that is most valuable to you. Alexander was speaking from experience since he had ab and doned his childhood friend just to be able to get a high-paying job, and he has regretted it ever since he made that choice because his childhood friend had died from being kidnapped and raped. When that happened, he was depressed since he had left his childhood friend all alone so that he could kiss his CEO's ass and get a higher-paid position. After she died, he always wondered if what he did was the cause of her death. But he knew that even if he didn't make the decision to abandon her, could he have stopped what happened? The answer was no, because he was so weak, and he would have had no power to save her, and probably would have ended up beaten up trying to protect her. But at least he tried, right? 
TFU had power, you would have been able to save her, no matter how weak you are. Power will give you the strength to protect those you love. It was as if the voice was reading his mind. After the voice said this, his mind had become even more shrouded in darkness and slowly his mind was changing. So if I had power, I could have saved her. Alexander quickly shook his head and didn't know why he was thinking like this. It was as if his mind was being taken over by darkness. The same thought kept crossing his mind over and over again, shrouding his mind even more with darkness. His mind was on the brink of collapsing as the darkness was overwhelming his mind. He was trying his hardest to resist, but he felt his mind getting darker and darker by the second. And just when his mind was about to be completely overwhelmed by the darkness, he heard a familiar voice call his name Alexander. The voice was sweet and soothing, causing Alexander to look up as he saw a familiar figure. Lara? Alexander was surprised by the person who was standing in front of, who was none other than his childhood friend. Lara giggled, seeing Alexander's poor. Surprised face. It has been a while since you looked so surprised like that. Alexander held his heart, which was hurting right now, since he knew this wasn't real, and instead it was a dream, but even so the emotions that he felt right now. I'm sorry, Lara, for what I did. Alexander, you don't need to apologize to me. You made a choice of your own free will, which had nothing to do with what happened to me. But before he could talk, he was interrupted. No, you need to stop blaming yourself. I never once blamed you, so stop. Ty, one, understand. Alexander sighed as he closed his eyes. Good, now you can continue on with your new life without any regrets. New life, what are you talking about? Lara didn't answer his question and only smiled. Before I leave you, must always remember what your mother always told us. That power is not what protects the people that you cherish, but it is you, and only you're the person who wields the power that protect them. And how you use that power is up to you. But always remember that when you have lots of power, there will be difficult decisions that you have to make. And whatever you chose, whether it is good or whether it is bad, doesn't change who you are. Lara had vanished before his eyes, ending the dream as Alexander returned back to his mind, being almost overwhelmed with darkness. But remembering what Lara told him, he resisted the darkness, and eventually the voice had vanished along with the darkness. Once the darkness was gone, a bright angelic light had blinded Alexander. After a while, it dimmed down, and in front of Alexander was a very beautiful woman with a golden aura around her. Alexander Hamilton, you have successfully passed my trial, which is quite intriguing. Chapter 2 Chapter 2 Alexander had read too many novels and mangas to act surprised to what was happening in front of him. You're not surprised to see me, hmm, must be all of those mangas and novels that you read in your previous life, said the goddess. Alexander shook his head, and I assume you're here to send me to another world or something like that, am I right? The goddess smiled. Actually, you are already in another world, or galaxy, should I say. That's where you were when you first woke up. So that wasn't a dream and all of that was real, thought Alexander, since he thought all of this must have been a dream, but it felt too real. But you are very special, since you are the first person to successfully resist that amount of dark side power. There were people before you that were consumed by the dark side, and their bodies were used to do evil things before I had to forcefully stop them. Putting aside what the goddess said, Alexander had asked about something that she said before. Before you said that I had successfully passed. The goddess shook her head. Then can I know what exactly the test was for? Of course, the test was to see whether you can resist the overwhelming power of the dark side. And if successful, the entire station will be cleansed of the dark side, and no longer try and influence people and take over their minds. Additionally, the station will now be under your control, explained the goddess. Alexander had processed all the information that he had received. So this station, it must be really powerful for it to be able to control somebody's mind. Said Alexander, yes, it is very powerful. In fact, you yourself know about it very much, said the goddess. Alexander had thought for a while, thinking about a station that could control people with the power of the dark side. But as soon as he thought about the dark side, it clicked in his brain. Don't tell me it's the Star Forge. 
Alexander had figured it out. Looks like we have a winner. You are correct. It is the legendary Starforge, which also means that you are currently in the Star Wars galaxy. Explain the goddess Alexander couldn't move his body right now, but if he could, he would be hitting the Michael Jackson moonwalk right now because of how excited and happy he was. But first he must know something. So before I continue on with my second life, tell me how did I die? The goddess sighed. You died from being overworked by your CEO who didn't even care when he heard that you had died and he just hired another person. Alexander may not be able to move his body, but he could still ball up his fist, which he did since he felt like a loser overworking himself to death at such a young age. He wasted his life only to die from overworking himself. So in this new he life, he promised to himself that he wasn't ever going to work for others. Instead, he will have others working for him. And other than making a company, the only other way is to create himself an empire. He had always wanted to be an emperor or a king and have lots of people serving him, but in the modern world, there were no such way to achieve that. But now that he is in this new galaxy, he will definitely do just that. And with the power of the Star Forge, he could definitely make himself an empire. While you're getting all excited thinking about what to do with your new life, I must first tell you that the galaxy that you are in is indeed the Star Wars galaxy, but there may be some changes to the storyline and how the galaxy is set up, explained the goddess. How is it different? asked Alexander, since he wanted to know just how different the galaxy was. T won't tell you. Instead, you will have to figure that out yourself said the goddess as she smiled. But before I let you go back to your body first, I will create two powerful force-sensitive subordinates for you that will be waiting for you once you wake up. Second, you will have the ability to use the force. And lastly, I will engrave in your head a very powerful lightsaber form, which your body will already know how to use, explained the goddess. So basically, besides me having the Star Forge, I am getting two subordinates who can use the Force. I will be able to use the Force, and then I am learning a very powerful lightsaber form. The goddess nodded. Well, we don't need you to overwork yourself to death again, so naturally I will help you. Plus, for being the first person in a thousand years to pass my test, I gave you more than what you were originally going to get. Alexander closed his eyes. I pray that this goddess who has bestowed me with such great rewards live a long and fulfilling life. Alexander don't know why he said that, when she was a goddess who will live for eternity. The goddess giggled at what Alexander did. All right, before you get carried away, I will return you to your body, and hopefully this time you don't overwork yourself to death. Before Alexander could even say anything, he was already returned to his body. Chapter 3 Chapter 3 as Alexander opened his eyes for the second time in this new galaxy, he saw something different from the first time he opened his eyes. This time, he saw a bright light that covered the entire room that he was in. He looked to his left and saw some type of robot standing on the side of his bed. The robot had noticed that Alexander was awake, so he quickly alerted the two subordinates that the goddess had given Alexander. The two subordinates came running into the room surprising Alexander by their gender and appearance. One of them was a female who had long black hair that was in a ponytail, wearing some light brownish-looking leather armor. She had blues and had a lightsaber at her hip. She also had some large breasts from Alexander observations. The other one was also a female that had some white-gray hair which had some strange accessories attached to the end of them. Her eyes were also white, matching her hair color. She was wearing some gray armor pieces that were on her arms, legs, one of her shoulders, and her stomach. While the first one had larger-than-average breasts, the second one had average breasts is what Alexander observed, but who knows what is average in this galaxy. Master, we are so glad that you are awake, said the black-haired one. Master, are you hurt anywhere? Asked the gray-haired one. Alexander felt like he was in heaven right now, since he had two beauties calling him master and asking him if he was okay. Even though his new life just started, Alexander was already thinking how pleasant his life already was. But first he needs to know what their names are, since he doesn't want to call them by their hair color. I'm fine, as you can see I have no physical injuries. 
Alexander had stood up out of the bed, revealing his well-shaped body. Be careful, sir. Even though you have recovered, who knows what might happen if you move too much, said the robot. Look, I'm fine, but first, what are your names? My name is Irina Master, said the black-haired girl. My name is Yona Master, said the gray-haired girl. And my name TB14, administrator of this station serving Master Alexander, said the robot Alexander was confused at first, since he doesn't remember the Starforge having a robot administrator, but then he thought that it must be the goddess doing, or if not, some unknown information about the Starforge that he didn't know. Tief, you are the administrator, then what am I? asked Alexander, since he thought that he controlled the station. As I said earlier, Master, I am but the administrator of the station that will follow all of your commands and is only loyal to you. And the station is quite big and difficult to manage by yourself, so I am here to assist you, said TB14 as he bowed, though because he was a robot, it was a very stiff bow. To see so if I want something to be produced, I just tell you to do it, and it will be done, asked Alexander. Exactly that, Master Alexander. Anything you ask, and it shall be done. Alexander thought about how useful that would be, since previously he was excited about having the Starforge, but later on that excitement would have probably went away, since he wouldn't know how to produce anything. Luckily, he has TB14, or else he would already be stressing, and he just started his new life. All right, Irina, Yona, let's go and explore the station. Alexander wanted to get a good look at all of the things that the station had. Master Alexander, I have a hollow map that you can look at instead of wasting your time exploring this massive station, said TB14, since some parts of the station had hull breaches and he didn't want Alexander to wander into one of the breaches and die. Till be fine, TB, said Alexander as he turned around to go and explore the station, but he was stopped by TB once again. Before you leave then, Master, can I get permission to produce some construction droids to repair the station since it has multiple hull breaches and the station could possibly collapse if it is not taken care of immediately? Ask TB, since he wanted his master to be able to walk through the station freely without having to worry about hull breaches. You have my permission, but first are the areas where the breaches are located, sealed off. Alexander didn't want to walk right into space so soon after he was reborn. Yes, master. When I was first activated, the first thing I did was scan the station, and once I found out about the hull breaches, I closed off all the areas where they were located. Then I should be fine walking throughout the station if you close them off, so stop worrying. Alexander didn't know why he was so worried. If they were closed off, he wouldn't be in any danger. Okay, Master Alexander, but just don't open any doors that are closed. T won't, said Alexander, as he headed out of the room. T don't know why he is so worried. I'll be fine, said Alexander as he talked out loud. Yona and Irina looked at each other before Yona said something. Master, it is our duty to protect you from any danger, so naturally, we would want to ensure your safety at all times, even if we are just walking through the station. Alexander decided to give in and ease their worries. Fine, I'll be careful, but as long as I have you two here, I should be fine, right? That is right, we will risk our lives to save you, Master. Said Yurina. That's right, we won't let a single thing hurt you, Master. Said Yona. Alexander sighed in defeat after hearing them, but was glad that he had some trusted subordinates by his side, or else he would be lonely in this big station by himself. Elsewhere, in the same system on the planet of Lahan, or Rakata Prime, which used to be the homeworld of the long-extinct species, the Rakata there were a humanoid race walking amongst the surface. This was the Rakata species, who have been underground for long time. They went underground to avoid the extinction of their species and have only just now come out only because they were given visions by the force of a person who would return them to glory would soon be coming to the planet. Chapter 4 Chapter 4 It took Alexander hours to explore the station, and he was exhausted after walking that long time, but it was worth it since he had discovered some good things about the station. Deck 1 was a hangar in the Star Forge. Deck 2 had an elevator leading up to the command center. Although the Starforge was an artifact of the dark side, 
but now it was turned neutral, having a balance between the light and dark side. A console on deck two could create light-sided Starforge robes. The Starforge robes were special Jedi robes. These robes were long, colored sand brown, and only its chest plate, gloves, and boots broke the ascetic simplicity. Nonetheless, it benefited a Force-sensitive wearer by increasing their abilities. Located on the Starforge, the command center had elevators which connected to Deck 2 and the viewing platform. It contained a large hologram of the Starforge itself. This was the room that Alexander had walked into before he went through that fight with the dark side. Built near the summit of the Starforge, the viewing platform was used to observe what was going on outside the space station. It was accessible via turbo lift from the command center. Alexander had gone to the commander center and made him one of the special Starforge robes. After putting it on, he had attempted to test his force powers by first sitting an object in front of him and trying to move it. He had failed the first few times since he wasn't concentrating hard enough, but after he focused completely, he was finally able to move the object in front of him. He had learned from Urena that the Force are mental-based abilities that are tapped through the practitioner's thoughts, emotions, and willpower. A.N. This next part is literally copy and paste about the abilities of the Force, giving a deep explanation of what a Force user could do. So if you want to read it, you can. If not, skip down to the part with and read after that. Though some stuff mentioned is actually interesting to read, these abilities could take a multitude of forms, including telepathy, telekinesis, and enhanced physical and metaphysical perception. It can allow people to affect and some control over physical forces, such as kinetic energy, inertia, friction, pressure, and even gravity, allowing them to be able to defy all of these and enhance the force and momentum they create with a variety of different effects and range. Such things allowed users of the Force to be almost completely unharmed by extreme impact, such as falling from great heights or being struck with great force or at high speed. It should be noted that anticipating the impact lessened its effects, allowing some users of the Force to not be stunned or even land on their feet with ease. This effectively enhanced the physical durability and recovery capability of a Force user. Power over physical forces and momentum also allowed Force users to partially defy gravity and other weight, allowing them to move and jump at unnatural speed and distance in seconds, though the speed only worked for limited times and was not constant, while jumping could be done repeatedly to those who have mastered this ability. This effectively enhanced the agility of those who used it, giving the user acrobatic capabilities at unnatural levels. The vitality, health, stamina, and endurance of a Force user was naturally enhanced to varying degrees and could even be temporarily boosted further by those more powerful and skilled, notably allowing aged or crippled users to be able to temporarily transcend their physical weaknesses or to allow a user to temporarily enhance their physical abilities beyond the limitations of their respective species. In addition to enhancing their own skill, Force users were capable of channeling the energy of the Force directly into the world around them. Dark side users generally used the Force for abilities that were malicious, immoral, and unnatural, such as the technique of telekinetically choking, strangling, or otherwise physically damaging their victims. The Sith were infamous for heavily using this ability to conjure Force lightning, which would deliver copious and often lethal amounts of electricity to the desired target. The Jedi preferred to use their abilities to heal and protect, closing wounds and shielding others with barriers of force energy. Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn discovered that Jedi could achieve near immortality through the force by existing as a force ghost after death. Manipulating the force entailed significant risks, however. When a person used the force beyond their body's ability to sustain it, the individual could suffer physical damage, accelerated aging, or in an extreme case, certain death by burning their own body cells from the inside out. Palpatine and Dorsk 81 are prime examples of excessive force usage and the consequences. This naturally happened to those who relied on the dark side of the force for their power. A.N. Hope that was informational for those that read the. For the next couple of days, Alexander had practiced using the force, 
trying out many abilities that he remembered from the series and some that he had read about on articles and whatnot. Alexander didn't know the extent of his Force abilities, so while he had tried out many of the Force abilities, he had tired himself out and passed out. But before passing out, he was successful in using some abilities, such as moving large objects and shooting lightning out of his fingers, but he was a long ways away from fully mastering it, since the Force lightning didn't fully come out of his finger as only sparks shot out. Over these past days, besides Alexander practicing with the Force, the station has been under constant repair by thousands of droids. It was almost at the level where the station's self-repair systems would be fully restored. But give it a couple of more days, and it would almost be there. Chapter 5 Chapter 5 After Alexander had practiced with his abilities for a few more days, he had asked Urena and Yona about the galaxy, since he had no clue how the galaxy looked. Urena had started to explain how ten years ago the Republic for the first time in a thousand years was split up in an event which was named the Great Separation, which created the Galactic Empire. Many worlds were dissatisfied with the corruption of the Republic and had joined sides with the Dark Lord Emperor Palpatine, who at the time was a very influential politician in the Republic Senate. Emperor Palpatine had used his influence to bribe many of the worlds to join his side. And one day, when he had enough power, he brought it up with the Senate of separating from the Republic. This angered some members of the Senate, who even called it treason against the Republic and demanded Palpatine be arrested. But the Chancellor of the Republic didn't dare to arrest Palpatine, since he knew the influence and power that Palpatine had in the Senate. In the end, it all came down to a vote in, which was exactly what Palatine was hoping for. After the vote which Palpatine won, the Senate was split up since nearly half of the Senate was with Palpatine while the other half stood by the Republic. After the voting, Palpatine went to the world of Terrace, which was an ecumenopolis planet just like Coruscant, and from there he announced to the galaxy of the creation of the Galactic Empire. It was a dark day for the Republic since they just lost nearly half of their worlds, but for the Empire, it was a good since the citizens of the Empire were actually happy since the corruption of the Republic Senate was a known thing, but not many people dared to do anything except Palpatine. But what the people didn't know was that the very people who were corrupt were the very people who created the Galactic Empire. Now, you may be wondering where the Jedi were in all of this. Well, the Jedi, since they are known as the protectors of peace, and such were involved in protecting the peace of the Republic, and had told the Chancellor that not letting them separate could make the Republic look bad, but allowing them to would also make them look weak. The Jedi still hadn't sensed the dark side in Palpatine at this time, so they didn't do anything and only gave the Chancellor advice, while the final decision was left to the Senate. But they didn't know that the majority of the Senate were on Palpatine's side until the vote. After the creation of the Galactic Empire with Palpatine as the Emperor, the people who had supported him were given positions of power in the Empire, while Darth Maul, Palpatine's apprentice, was tasked with creating a school which would train Force-sensitive children in the ways of the Sith. All of this was done in secret without the Republic knowing. Months after the creation of the Galactic Empire, the Jedi had started receiving visions of a great war that would happen. But the Jedi didn't know when this vision would happen, nor who it was going to be with. They had also started feeling a rise in the dark side after the Galactic Empire came to power, which made the Jedi start to secretly investigate the Empire. That was all that Yurina knew about the galaxy, so far. But Alexander was surprised, since both the Galactic Empire and the Republic exists at the same time. He remembered the goddess said that there would be some changes to the galaxy, but this was too much of a change since the reason for the creation of the Galactic Empire was that Emperor Palpatine wanted to complete the goal of the ancient Sith, which was to dominate the galaxy. But in the galaxy he was currently in, Palpatine had already half accomplished his plan, and next all he needed to do was to conquer the rest of the Republic and the galaxy. Alexander was holding his head since the galaxy was all a mess and wasn't like canon at all, 
which was actually interesting to him, since it gave him a new challenge, since he didn't know what was going to happen in the future. But for his future Pell, Anne's, it also caused some problems, since he planned to capitalize on the Clone Wars and make himself an empire, but with the current galaxy, he didn't know if the Clone Wars would happen or not. While he was thinking about the galaxy and its changes, TB-14 had walked into the command room. Master, I have researched the data from the blood samples, and it came back that you have a midi-chlorian count of 50,000, while both Yona and Yurena have a midi-chlorian count of 16,000 each, which means that you have more midi-chlorians than that of Anakin Skywalker. Alexander only laughed after he heard that, since of course he would have a higher midi-chlorian than the actual chosen one after being reincarnated. Plus, it was probably another gift from the goddess. Yona and Yurena looked at each other and thought at the same time, Master is quite powerful, isn't he? Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Master, are you sure you want to head down to the planet? Asked TB-14 since Alexander wanted to go down to the surface of the Rakata homeworld. Yes, I'm sure. Alexander at first thought that he was dreaming when he saw the Rakata in his dreams, but after talking with Yona and Yurina about it, it was more than likely visions from the Force trying to tell Alexander something. The Rakata homeworld was also in the vision, so Alexander thought that if he goes down to the Rakata homeworld, then he will find out what the vision means. Let me send down two transports full of combat droids for your protection. Master, we don't know what is on that world, said TB-14. T will be fine, so don't worry about it, TB. Plus I'm going to have Yona and Yurina with me, so there is nothing to worry about. Alexander thought that TB was worrying too much, though since he is his master, he can kinda understand TB wanting to protect him, and he actually felt good that he cared about him so much, even if he is a robot. At least let me send some security droids with you on the transporter. TB was hoping that Alexander would agree to this, since he didn't want anything bad to happen to him. Fine. Alexander just gave in since after some thinking, he has only just come into this world, and if anything bad happened to him on the planet, he would only have Yona and Urena to help him, and he himself has yet to master his Force abilities. After accepting TB's request, Alexander headed to the hangar on Deck 1, where an XS stock light freighter, which was made by TB, was waiting for him. Of course the one flying was a robot, since Urena and Yona didn't know how to fly a ship yet, and since he just came to this galaxy he didn't know either. The XS stock light freighter was a relatively standard-sized model of starship. The vessels had a saucer-shaped body, yellow plating, and a blunt cockpit with a narrow viewport that jutted forward from the ship's center. The aft of the freighters featured a heavily armored hull with a pair of sublight engines, and the craft were armed with two dorsal and two portside laser cannons. Alexander boarded the ship and was greeted by two droids who saluted him while saying, Welcome aboard, Master. The droids were similar to the HK-51 assassination droids. Alexander walked by them and headed into the ship. Urena and Yona, who were following him, had sat down in the passenger area that had a hollow table for playing games and a sofa to sit on. Alexander had looked around the ship a little before he headed to the cockpit and sat down, telling the pilot that they were ready. Alexander had strapped in before the ship started to take off and leave the station. He held on to the seat since this was his first time flying, and space, and didn't know what to expect. But nothing felt weird when they were flying away from the station, probably because the ship had gravity inside. But he knew once they started to enter the atmosphere, things will start to shake because of the pressure from entering a planet's gravitational pull. Alexander enjoyed the view outside, looking at the many stars of the galaxy. But as they got closer to the planet, he saw lots of ship wreckages, which could be salvaged and probably sold for some decent money in the galaxy. He also thought that the planet had asteroid rings, but after getting a closer look, it was just ship wreckages from the past war, which happened centuries ago. Why nobody came to collect or salvage these wreckages is a mystery, since it was a lot of wreckages in the system, which if salvaged would be very profitable for whoever salvaged it. Just then, Alexander came up with a thought to start selling the salvage to people, 
to earn him some money, which he would use to maybe make a corporation, a mercenary organization, or just use it to bribe other rich people. There were many uses which could benefit him if it is used right. As Alexander was thinking about what he could do with the profit from the salvage, he was interrupted when the ship had entered the planet's atmosphere, Kazi, meaning the ship to shake just a little, but not as much as he thought. Instead, it was like plain turbulence, which didn't last that long. After getting into the atmosphere, Alexander started to feel something telling him to go to a certain location on the planet. And from what Yona told him, this could be the force trying to guide him, so he closed his eyes and concentrated. He kept concentrating until they had arrived at the location where the force was guiding him. Pilot land, right here. Yes, master. The pilot started landing the ship exactly where Alexander told him. The ship had landed, and Alexander had got up from his seat and was greeted by Yona and Urena standing behind him. Did the force guide you here, master? Yes, it was telling me to come here, so whatever it's trying to tell me is around here somewhere. So let's get looking said Alexander as he walked towards the door of the ship. Yona and Urena looked at each other. Master must not be able to feel the amount of dark side power that we feel, since he is too focused on finding whatever the force is guiding him to, so let's tell him before it's too late. Yona nodded as the left to Alexander. But by the time they made it, it was too late. Chapter 7 Chapter 7 By the time Yona and Urena had made it to the door, Outside the ship were already a group of humanoid figures standing around the ship. The HK assassin droids were already in front of Alexander with their weapons aimed at the group of humanoid people who they identified to be the long-extinct Rakata species. Irina and Yona had pulled Alexander back into the ship, trying to keep him from danger. That's when one of the Rakata had come forward and got his knees, basically groveling on the ground. Please, Great One, help our people. All the Rakata had done the same thing groveling themselves on the ground before Alexander, Alexander, who was confused on what was going on, walked forward, ignoring Yona and Urena's complaints. What are you talking about, and what do you mean by Great One? Asked Alexander. He was curious on why they called him that, but knowing how he was led here by the Force, he had suspected the Force was the reason why they were calling him that. Our Grand Elder, the last Rakata to be able to use the Force, had received a prophecy before he died. In this prophecy, there was mention of a nun Rakata Force wielder, a chosen one who will come to the planet in a ship which looks exactly like your ship, Great One. And in this prophecy, it is said that the Chosen One shall lead us to our former glory, restore our great empire to what it was before our great fall, and help us to reconnect to the Force again. The Rakata Elder had explained why they called him the Great One, so that's why the Force guided me here, and there is no doubt that the Chosen One they are talking about is me. Thought Alexander the Rakata were still groveling, waiting on the response from Alexander. For Alexander, this was a good opportunity, since he could basically gain the loyalty of the Rakata species and bring them back into the galaxy. He could restore the Infinite Empire, which in its time controlled most of the galaxy which could be used by Alexander in future if he ever decides to invade a planet or something. Alexander put his hand on his head as he sighed with a smirk on his face, since not only did he get the Star Forge and is able to use the Force, but now he has some people who want to follow him. Looking back at the Rakata, Alexander decided to accept them. Well, since I was led here with the Force, I am sure that your species is the reason that I was led here, so if you decide to follow me, I will help your species to restore its glory, said Alexander. The Rakata looked quite pleased and bowed their heads while swearing to follow Alexander and protect him as their supreme leader. Urena and Yona both had a shocked expression on their face since firstly they had discovered the long extinct species of the Rakata actually lived, and not only that, but now their master had just got them to follow him. But most of all, the fact that their master was being called a chosen one by the Force was something unexpected. But with his high midi-chlorian count, they both thought that there was no way that he was just a normal Force user, and there must be something special about him. Well, now they have found out what is special about him. 
Alexander, while looking at the ricotta, wondered how many of them were left to be exact. Elder, how many ricotta are alive on the planet? There are no more than five million of us left on the planet, and most of us are below the surface of the planet and are in different clans which some may not willingly join you. So, I need to try and convince every clan to join me to get their loyalty. Yes, Supreme Leader. My clan is made up of nearly 100k Rakata, who are all in the underground city. Originally, we were part of another clan, hundreds of years ago. But after the Grand Elder announced about the prophecy, not a lot of people believed it after a hundred years and even called it just a story. That's when the people who believed in the prophecy had split off from the original clan, forming a new clan after fighting our way to freedom. From then on, we continued to wait until the Chosen One arrived, and now that you're here, the other clans should follow your lead, and if not, then our clan will support you if you want to force them. The Elder said that last part, since to truly bring the Rakata back to glory, Alexander will need the support of all the Rakata, so those that don't follow him will naturally be enemies and would have to be forced to follow. Alexander didn't want to force anybody to do anything since he had the mind of a modern-day human, but he still knew that he would need to adapt to doing things like this, especially if he wants to make an empire. Chapter 8 Chapter 8 After accepting the Rakata Elder and his clan, Alexander had asked for some of the names of his new subjects. He had found out that the Elder's name was Oldriar, and he had Asan Anda daughter. His son's name was Jargug, and his daughter's name was Kavna. They didn't have last names in the Rakata society, since last names were given to those of power, but since they were cut off from the force, nobody was able to surpass each other in terms of physical combat unless they were a warrior who was trained to fight. After learning some things about the Elder and his clan, Alexander was taken to their underground city, which was made centuries ago. He had entered a tunnel with Yona, Urena, and two HK assassin droids, and after walking for a few minutes, he had arrived at the underground city. It was truly a good-looking city from what Alexander could see. There were also many Rakata walking around, going about their daily activities. Once Alexander had walked in, some of the Rakata were looking at him weird, since they hadn't seen another race since they were forced underground centuries ago. Supreme Commander, if you would follow me this way to the sacred temple this way, please, said Old Riar, as he bowed. Hearing himself being called Supreme Commander, Alexander didn't quite like the sound of it since it sounded weird and was too long, so he told Oldriar to just call him My Lord instead, since it was shorter to say and less weird. While walking through the city, Elder Oldriar had announced that the Chosen One had finally come to save them, which caused many people to start bowing to Alexander. Some of them even had hope in their eyes, since, as many know, their species was slowly dying out from living underground too long and from the constant fights with the other clans that killed off some of them. The birth rates of new Rakata were not at all able to keep up with the number of them who died, and soon they would have been extinct if they didn't come to the surface. After walking past all the people bowing, Alexander had arrived at the sacred temple. Inside the sacred temple was something that Alexander wanted, something that would help him in the future in building an empire. But while he was walking through the underground city, he felt that something was off, and the force was warning him about something. He figured that it probably had something to do with the Rakata, since they used to be evil, but from what he has seen they appeared to have changed, or so he thought. Here we are, my lord, the door to the sacred vault which contains all the technology from ancient times. It is said that only the Chosen can open the doors using the Force. Alexander looked at the door and could feel the Force telling him to open it, so he put his hand up and focused on opening the door, which was easy for him. After the door opened, inside the room he could sense that some things in the room were corrupted by the dark side of the Force, while some things weren't. He walked over to one of the boxes and found some lightsabers that were ancient that were corrupted by the dark side. He picked one up, and immediately the darks tried to corrupt him. But this time it didn't take long to resist, and he was able to resist and get rid of the dark side 
which was corrupting the lightsaber. Urena and Yona, seeing what Alexander just did with the lightsaber, went over to the box to find that this box was the place that they felt all that dark side power from. Luckily, their master was able to resist the dark side. Alexander had pressed the button on the lightsaber, igniting as he looked in amazement, since now he had his own lightsaber. Since he came to this galaxy, he has only held Yona's or Urena's lightsaber to practice, but now he had his own, which looked to be yellow or golden. It looked golden, but could be considered yellow, so he didn't know which to call it. While Alexander was looking throughout the room, observing all the things that were in there, he didn't notice that Elder Oldriar had left the room and had actually returned with almost a hundred armed people that were now surrounding the temple. Urena and Yona had sensed what was happening and pulled out their lightsabers, which made Alexander turn around to see what was going on. There were a ton of people that were at the door to the vault with guns aimed at them. Elder Oldriar had come forward in front of all the Rakata and spoke, I would like to thank you for opening this vault so that my people can once again take over the stars. Your sacrifice will be the first step in realizing our dream, which is to dominate the galaxy once again. The Elder was laughing as he finished his sentence. Once we get rid of you, we will start taking over the surface of the planet and rebuilding our species once again and nobody will be able to stop us with the ancient tech which has been locked in this vault for thousands of years. Urena and Yona were standing in front of Alexander with their lightsabers, while the HK assassin droids had taken Alexander to hide behind a box. The Elder, seeing this, didn't want to wait too long, so he ordered his soldiers to start attacking. Alexander had pulled out a holo communicator and called TB, who was on the station, TB had answered the holo call, and in front of Alexander was a holographic image of TB. Master is everything, all right down there. Asked TB, we were betrayed by the Rakata species and are currently under attack. Send some combat droids down here, said Alexander. TB had lots of questions he wanted to ask, but tight now his master's safety is his top priority. Yes, master, I will immediately send all the combat droids down to the surface of the planet. They will be there in ten minutes, Master. Okay, good, then I'll see you when I return to the station, said Alexander as he ended the hollow call. Alexander had peeked over the box and saw that Yona and Urena were blocking all the blaster shots with their lightsabers, while the HK assassin droids were shooting from behind cover. Yona was blocking with her double-sided golden lightsaber, while Urena was blocking with her double-sided red lightsaber. Alexander had thought of something. Since only the Force could open the vault door, then only the Force could close it as well, so he used the Force and closed the vault door, blocking any more of the Rakata from coming in. Alexander stood up since it was safe now. We should be safe until TB sends the combat droids to assist us. They should be here within ten minutes. Good thinking, Master. But what are we going to do with the Rakata now that they have attacked you? asked Yona. I know TB will probably suggest we destroy them, but we could also use them. We can probably come up with a way to make them completely loyal, but I'll think about that after we have beat them, said Alexander, since the Rakata were only a few, and he didn't want to eradicate their entire species when he could possibly control them. Chapter 9 Chapter 9 TB while being the administrator of the station also was given the knowledge of the galaxy, such as the various ships and droids and other technology. And when he heard that his master Alexander was under attack, he immediately used that knowledge to make an army of sentinel droids and three Venator II class Star Destroyer. The Sentinel Droid series, also known as the War Droid or Military Droid series, was the only known series of android among the war machines used by the Galactic Republic and the Sith Empire in the Jedi Civil War. Variants included the Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, and Mark V, which were all outwardly identical. The Venator II-class Star Destroyer was a model of the Venator-class Star Destroyer utilized by the naval forces of the Galactic Republic during the Clone Wars against the Separatist Alliance. Successor to the Venator I-class Star Destroyer, the Star Destroyer was equipped with a forward-mounted hangar bay, 
as well as four port and four starboard mounted DBY-827 heavy turbolaser turrets and a single medium dual turbolaser cannon. The Starforge had produced these ships and droids almost instantly, and TB had sent them down to the planet's surface immediately to protect Alexander. The ships had engaged their hyperdrives and jumped into orbit of the planet, which took a couple of seconds since the planet was already in the same system. After exiting hyperspace in orbit of the planet, the droid admiral had ordered the LAS to go ahead to the planet's surface along with the fighters and bombers. The droid admiral was given permission to use all of their resources to save Alexander. So while the ship descends into the planet's atmosphere, the admiral sent down the transports and fighters with bombers to save Alexander. Their main objective was to protect Alexander and destroy the people attacking him, and they would not fail. While the LATs along with the fighters and bombers were heading into the atmosphere of the planet, the Rakata were trying to open the vault with everything that they had, but it was useless since the vault would not open. Elder Oldriar was raging since this was their perfect opportunity to fulfill the Rakata's long-lost wish of dominating the galaxy once again, but he didn't expect that the door to the vault would close once again, and now they couldn't get in. But as he was raging, he thought about something that they hadn't used yet, which was a bomb that was so ancient it hadn't been used in centuries and was also a great relic to their race. But now he needed to use that bomb, so he had his soldiers place the bomb near the front of the door and prepare to set it off. Unfortunately, the time it took to move the bomb was too much, since from outside the droids had landed and were now closing in on their position. So he had some Rakata split off and defend the entrance of the tunnel while the others moved the bomb into place. But suddenly, the people he sent to defend the tunnel came running back, and behind them, blaster shots could be seen as the sentinel droids kept pushing forward. The droids were not stopping at all and were swarming the underground city. The Rakata, who were not involved in the attack and were just normal civilians or workers, were hiding in their homes. They didn't know what was going on nor why they were being attacked, but they figured that it had something to do with the fighting that they heard near the sacred temple. Many knew that the one who was prophesied to lead them into glory once again was in that direction with the elder of the city, and they also saw some warriors of the city going in that direction also. They wondered what was going on and hoped that the Chosen One was all right. While the civilians were hiding, the sentinel droids had completely swarmed the city and were now having an all-out battle with Rakata warriors and the Elder. But the droids were superior to the Rakata warriors and were great in number and had overwhelmed the Rakata warriors. The Elder was taken down and the other, our Rakata, were killed. In the vault, Alexander had opened the door and was greeted by a sentinel droid commander. My lord, your droid army is at your command. We have successfully captured the city and have secured the area. Alexander sighed since he didn't know how he would have defeated all of those Rakata without help. Very good, Commander. How many droids do we have on the ground? We have around 10k droids on the ground, with fighters and bombers patrolling the area, and the Venators are descending into the atmosphere and should be here within the hour with thousands of more droids. Good. When they get here, I want the other Rakata clans to be subjugated and control of the planet within a month. Alexander said, a month, because he was sure that they would need a couple of weeks to subjugate all the Rakata and control the entire planet. Chapter 10 Chapter 10 As Alexander walked through the city, he saw the bodies of the Rakata who tried to fight back against the droids. There were also some of the Rakata who were hiding in their houses were being dragged out by sentinel droids and escorted to the surface where they will remain captured. Alexander didn't know whether they were involved in what the Elder was doing, but still ordered them to be captured just in case. After being betrayed by the Elder, he doesn't know who to trust, so for now he will keep them under close watch until he figures things out. But as he was walking to the surface, one of the Rakata had tried to approach him but was thrown to the floor by one of the droids. Wait, please, why are you doing this? Asked the Rakata who was thrown to the ground. 
Alexander looked at the Rakata who were being escorted to another location, seeing the fear in their eyes, and had decided to answer them. Your elder, along with some other Rakata, had attacked me after I opened the sacred vault, so now all Rakata will be subjugated until I decide what to do with you. Please, we had nothing to do with the elder, as we are the only clan who truly believes in the prophecy of the Chosen One who will lead us to glory. The Rakata had started groveling on the floor. Whatever the elder and the other warriors did, we had nothing to do with it. So please spare us, and allow us to serve you, we will even fight our own if that will please. The Rakata was groveling with all his might, hoping not to disrespect Alexander. Before Alexander answered, he looked at Irina and Yona, to see what they think about it. Master, I can feel that he is not telling a lie, and unlike the elder who I couldn't sense was lying or not, I can sense that he is telling the truth said Yona. To agree with Yona, Master, this Rakata is not telling a lie. However, that doesn't mean we can just trust them, especially after they tried to attack Master, said Yurena. But the one who did attack Master has already been captured, so there is no need to treat them like this right. Master, some of them are innocent and don't know what is going on, said Yona Alexander, knew Yona was right, they did not do anything as he was told that all the warriors of the clan had been killed already, and only civilians remained. But even so, he must still be cautious of them, since they could turn against him at any second. To understand what you are saying, Yona, so I will tell the droids to treat them a little better. But like Irina said, they did attack me, even if it wasn't them personally, other members of their clan attacked me, so for now they will be subjugated until further noticed said Alexander. To understand, master, said Yona. After that, Alexander had ordered the droids to treat the Rakata with at least some respect while he boarded the Venator which had landed in the forest. As he boarded the Venator, he was welcomed by droids who had formed a line with droids standing on both sides as he walked onto the ship. He had gone to the bridge where the droid admiral was located. My Lord General TB told me to inform you to contact him once you board the ship, do you want to speak with him in the communications room? Yes, put him through in the communications room, said Alexander as he walked to the communications room. In the communications room, an image of TB was shown. Master, it is good to see that you are okay. Yes, thanks to you, TB, for sending three venators with an entire army to save me, Alexander said, though he thought that it was a little extreme, but he didn't really care that much. T would have sent more, but I figure that this was more than sufficient to rescue Master, said TB. But Master, what are we going to do with the Rakata who we have captured? Said TB. Well, the ones remaining in the clan are mostly civilians, so I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do, and some of them seem to be really devoted to this prophecy, and the ones who attacked me are already dead, so I won't just kill the entire race just because of that said Alexander Sin. See, killing the entire race just because of what a couple of people did was just morally wrong. T thought you would say something like that, Master. So I have looked through all the information that I have and have come up with a device that would be implanted into their heads that would over time increase their loyalty while also it would prevent them from going against you and betraying you, said TB. So basically it's like a mind control device. Said Alexander, not exactly, Master, since the person will have control of their own mind. It's just that the device will influence their mind to not go against you, nor have any thoughts of betraying you, but they will retain their own emotions, thoughts, and actions, explained TB. TC, this device is actually good, and with the station, you could mass produce these for all the Rakata. Alexander thought that this was a good idea since he wouldn't have to worry about the Rakata and their loyalty and would gain lots of new subjects, though he knows that some people might consider this to be mind-controlling if they ever found out, but he didn't care. T want you to start making these immediately TB around like 5 million so that we can't implant them in all the Rakata. Yes, master, it will be done. Alexander ended the call and pulled up an image of the planet, he was going to use this chance to improve his ability as a commander for the future when he is in a major battle. Chapter 11 Chapter 11 
The other Rakata clans had heard what was going on, on the surface of the planet. Most of them had decided to send out their warriors to fight the invading army, since this was their ancestral home, and they weren't going to give it up without a fight. Nor were they going to sit in their underground cities and wait for the enemy, so the various clans took to the surface to engage the droids. Fighters and bombers weren't much help, since the entire planet over time has become covered with forest everywhere. So it was hard to attack the enemy who were hiding under the trees without having the enemy location revealed by the droids on the ground. The Rakata were using the trees to their advantage, ambushing multiple groups of droids at a time. But the droids were too strong and had great coordination, so the ambushes only destroyed a few droids, while the Rakata who attacked suffered the most. Alexander at first was commanding the droids from the command room on the Venator, but then decided to head into battle so that he can test out his lightsaber form on the Rakata and get the experience of what a battle is like. When he first encountered a group of Rakata, he had used his lightsaber to block the blaster shots. But as he was blocking them to him, time appeared to slow down as he was easily blocking all the blaster shots. And when it came to close combat, he felt his body move on its own as he fought with one of the Rakata. Urena and Yona advised against him fighting one of the Rakata by himself, but he did it anyway. He wasn't ignoring them since he knew that Hay only wanted for him to be safe, but he wanted to be able to fight by himself since if both Urena and Yona were to be defeated and he was left to fight by himself without no actual experience, then he would probably be defeated easily, but by him getting some experience fighting real foes, then he will get better. After successfully winning his first engagement, Alexander had proceeded to conquer another clan's underground city and subjugated the people that were there. He had all of them taken to the main encampment, which was a place where the Rakata who he subjugated were located. At the encampment, the Rakata were currently having a device put into their heads, which they were told would keep them from betraying Alexander. Many of the Rakata accepted it, believing that they could prove their loyalty to the Chosen One and once again rise in glory. Some others were reluctant to accept it, but had no choice since they were forced. It took three weeks of fighting to finally subjugate the entire planet. The total number of Rakata remaining after the fighting was over was 4.5 million, meaning that 500k had died during the war, which was a lot since their species was already so small in numbers. After all, the Rakata were subjugated and had gotten their implants. Alexander had begun construction of a major city on the planet. But it really wasn't construction. It was more of restoring a city which had been completely overrun with nature from being abandoned for centuries. The Rakata were small in numbers, but Alexander wanted to have at least three cities on the world. The first city would be the capital of the planet, while the other two would be placed in strategic locations on the planet. But first, he would have to wait until the droids got done surveying the planet for the location of resources. After the locations of resources are found, the cities will be built close to those locations in order to effectively mine the resources. For now, he only had plans for three cities, but in the future, when he reveals his empire to the galaxy and start engaging in diplomacy with other empires, his planet will start receiving lots of visitors. But what he was talking about was probably years away and wouldn't happen anytime soon. And he needs to personally see the rest of the galaxy first before he reveals his empire. And the best way to do that was to see the galaxy. His first plan was to start gaining fame as a trader or make a corporation. Some people may think that this will require him to work hard, but it won't since in realty he would have droids actually running things while would just be the face of the corporation. But having a corporation of pure droids would probably get suspicious or might cause some unwarranted problems. So his next idea was to ask TB if he had the knowledge of cloning. And if he did, he wanted to start making cloning facilities so that he can make clones who specialize in certain things. Some clones would be used for war or some for leading. It was a variety of different things that Alexander could do with the clones. And if TB didn't know the process of making clones, 
then Alexander would just send a team of stealth droids to Kamino to steal the Kaminoans' research on cloning. Alexander always liked the clones, since they are literally able to be bred for war, and their genetic sequence can be altered to anything you like. He could basically make an infinite amount of soldiers, though they will take some time to grow. Chapter 12 Chapter 12 The reconstruction of the old Rakata city took six months to clear out all the trees and vines that covered the city and to start making an area for farming so that the Rakata can start producing food. The city was massive and could hold up to 10 million people. Alexander had asked some Rakata about it and was told that this was actually a small city. A massive city could hold up to 50 million people such as the old Rakata capital, which location has been lost. Alexander had multiple droid teams going over the entire planet, scanning any resources and old cities, wildlife, and shipwrecks. He wanted the location of shipwrecks, since they could break down the ships and use the materials for construction. The wildlife could be hunted for food or used for some other things. As for the old Rakata cities, he could start clearing them out and exploring them for anything useful that they had. He was lucky that he had TB, since he didn't have any knowledge on how to construct a city, especially one in a galaxy where space travel is common. Besides the construction of the city, TB has been working on making an artificial intelligence that would help out Alexander and also be able to manage the large amount of droids that he estimate will be produced in the future. He knows that he can't stop Alexander from leaving the safety of the system, and he can't leave the station since he is the administrator. So using his knowledge, he thought to make a artificial intelligence that will be with Alexander wherever he goes and be able to help him in whatever he needs. It will also be able to connect to all the droids to coordinate them better in times of battle. He estimated that the project will take at least a full year to complete. It would take that long since he wanted to make sure that it was perfect and had no flaws and it could keep learning and getting smarter as time went on. He knows the dangers of an AI that has no limits. So just as him, the AI will see Alexander as its master and follow all of his orders. Alexander throughout the six months has not been just sitting idly by. He has been training, discovering new force abilities, and mastering the ones he currently discovered. The one that he is currently trying to master is the infamous Force Choke. The ability to choke or strangle a person using the Force. It was considered a dark side move, but many Jedi often used it as well. He wanted to learn one of the most intimidating abilities of the Force, so that he could use it on people in the future when they disrespect him. Besides him learning new Force abilities, TB had discovered why the Rakata were unable to use the Force. He had discovered this when he looked at a blood sample of Alexander and one from the Rakata. The Rakata's loss of the Force was because of a genetic mutation caused by the plague which had spread throughout their species a thousand years ago. A cure could be made, but TB doesn't have the ingredients of the cure on hand, and he would need things from outside the system to be able to make one. He already told Alexander about this, since coming up with the cure could potentially restore their connection with the Force. Hearing this, Alexander had planned to head out of the system to get the ingredients needed, and when he heard about where he needed to go to get them, he was even more excited. The place he needed to go was none other than Coruscant. He was extremely happy since he would get to see the capital of the Republic up close and for his first time see a planet that is an entire city in person. He was prepared to leave immediately, but TB had asked him to wait until the AI was done first, since going to a dangerous place where the Jedi Order is located and where the Republic was located would not be safe. And since the Republic was quickly losing influence, it was a very dangerous place for Alexander. But he understood the reason why TB asked him not to go, since after he thought about it, if he is caught by the Jedi Order, who knows what they would do to him. So he decided to wait until the AI was done before he went out into the galaxy. Also, the appearance of the Rakata would probably raise some suspicion in the galaxy, since previously they had enslaved most of the galaxy. Meanwhile, on Kamino, the stealth droids had just sneaked into the Kamino facility 
and were now searching for the location of the cloning data. They had to search around the facility for a while before they found it. But the data was so protected, and it was a lot of it, that it would take some time to break through the protection and to download the data. Chapter 13, Chapter 13, Two Months Later In the middle of the city, there was a large, luxurious-looking palace that had droids patrolling all around it. Surrounding the palace were various buildings, which included houses, training grounds, and a landing area for small transports. Inside the palace, there were many rooms that were used for various things. One of these rooms was a training room which Alexander used to train with Urena and Yona. Currently, Urena and Yona were training with Alexander in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Why hand-to-hand -hand combat, you ask? Well, not all battle are won with a lightsaber, and there might be a time when Alexander loses his lightsaber, or he doesn't want to reveal it while he is out in the open. Of course, he could just use a blaster, but by having more training in other forms of combat, he could expand his abilities to have more options when it comes to fighting. Currently, Urena was having a one-on-one -on -one with Alexander as she charged at him, but she had taken a wrong step and slipped while Alexander had caught her so that she won't get hurt. Alexander caught her, preventing her from getting hurt, but while he did, his face had landed in her breasts as his hands were wrapped around her waist. Alexander tried to speak, but his voice was muffled, so Urena sat up, letting him breathe. I'm sorry, master, it seems that I lost my step. Luckily you saved me, said Urena, with a smile on her face. Alexander's face was a little red from what happened before, but he had experience in things like this, so he wasn't too embarrassed by what happened, but the way Urena was sitting on him was causing something to rise up. I'm glad you are okay, but can you please get up now? said Alexander, since the longer she sat on him, the bigger it is going to get. Urena had already noticed something poking her butt, so she looked over her shoulder and seen what it was. After seeing what it was, she looked back at Alexander. Did I make you like that master? asked Urena with her innocent expression. Yeah, kind of, so that's why I need you to move or something dangerous is going to happen. Alexander wasn't lying, since ever since he began his new life in this galaxy, he hadn't indulged in any sexual activity and has been more focused on training. As a result, he has a lot of pent-up testosterone that he needs to release. In his previous life, he had seen his fair share of sex with one-night stands. But Urena didn't even move and was still sitting in the same position until Yona came and grabbed her from off of Alexander. Urena had looked at Yona. Why did you grab me, Yona? Because if I didn't, the situation would have gotten worse. You remember what Lady Anna taught us about serving our master, right? Said Yona Urena remembers what she was taught, since Lady Anna was the person who raised them since they were little kids and taught them everything they know and even trained them. She even told them about men and sex, which Urena forgot about. They were trained to serve their master in his every need, even his sexual needs, but so far their master hadn't asked them to do anything of the sort. So that's what happens when Master gets excited, asked Urena. Yeah, so don't do it again unless asked by Master, all right, said Yona, who looked like a big sister talking to her little sister. All right, I'm sorry, Master, said Urena as she bowed her head. Alexander rubbed the back of his head since he had hit it when he fell trying to catch Urena. It's all right. Just be careful next time. After that, Alexander had gone to the bathroom, since at this moment his lower area wouldn't calm down, especially after Urena was sitting on it. As Alexander left the training room, Urena and Yona had begun to talk with each other. Lady Anna did say that young men were more sexually active, but it seems Master is different, said Urena. Yes, it seems so, but she also said that it is dangerous for a man to not relieve themselves for long periods of time. Yona started thinking about something before she came up with a plan. Master is Proba, Bly holding back, which is bad for him, so tonight we will sneak into his room and help Master in that area, said Yona with a determined expression. Verena nodded her head, and they begin to make their plans to sneak into Alexander's room. While this was going on in an unknown place, Lady Anna was laughing as she was watching what Urena and Yona were doing, and she remembered that she forgot to teach them a few things. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. 
That night, both Urena and Yona had snuck into Alexander's room, even using the Force to evade the droids that were guarding his room. They were hiding their presence with the Force, so Alexander didn't even feel them sneak into his room. While they were doing this, Alexander was fast asleep, dreaming about his future plans that he had planned for building his empire. The first thing that he was planning on doing was building a fleet, then the second was to start expanding more into the unknown regions, since there are lots of resources that he could exploit from those systems and possibly new planets to conquer. But all of this was years away, since right now he doesn't have much of an army. Seeing that he was sleeping, both Urena and Yona climbed into his bed and got under the covers. Warning, slight R18 ahead. Yona had taken the initiative and pulled his cock out. Urena had looked at it since it was laying down facing upwards. Why is so soft, said Urena, as she started tapping, causing it to stand up. Wah, so big, said Urena, as it had got bigger and harder. Urena, remember, this is called an erection, said Yona. Urena nodded, since she remembers. Now we grab it with our hands like this, said Yona, as she placed her hand around his cock. Urena did the same, copying what Yona did. Alexander right now was wide awake, feeling and hearing everything that was going on, and he wasn't going to stop them, since what they were doing started to feel good. Both Urena and Yona started moving their hands up and down, stroking his cock with both of their hands. It felt so good since he has been holding himself back for months. And when he thought it couldn't get any better, Yona had inserted his cock into her mouth, causing him to remove the cover. Jesus Christ, said Alexander out loud since what she was doing felt too good. Thought he doesn't know why he said Jesus' name since he is in another galaxy which Jesus doesn't even exist in. Yona stopped sucking his cock and looked at him. Did that feel good, master? Yes, it did, answered Alexander. Then allow me to continue, said Yona, who was also joined by Urena. They both started licking all around his cock, giving him double the pleasure. After a few minutes, Alexander couldn't take it anymore and released his cum all over both Urena and Yona's face. But it didn't end there, as for the rest of the night, the three of them pleasured each other messing up the bed completely as the atmosphere in the room was filled with pleasure. Alexander had become a beast that night, completely dominating both Urena and Yona, making them come countless times. Luckily, nobody was in the palace besides them, since Urena and Yona voices were too loud. The next morning, Alexander opened his eyes and looked down, seeing both Urena and Yona laying on his chest with a satisfied expression on their face. He slowly and gently moved them off of him and left to go take a shower. While in the shower, he was thinking about what happened last night, and he must say he was surprised that both Urena and Yona would even do something naughty like that. But he wasn't complaining or anything, just surprised. While he was thinking about the things that happened last night, both Urena and Yona had came and joined him in the shower, causing him to shower for an extra hour before getting out. After drying off, he put on his clothes, which was a, just a Starforge robe, and headed outside the room. Once he left the room, a droid was waiting on him. Sir, there is a message from TB. He is waiting in the communications room. He says that it is urgent. Okay, thank you. E head there now said Alexander, as he walked down the hallway and turned inside a room which was empty, except for a table in the middle. He walked to the table and seen a button flashing, and he pushed it. In front of him was a holographic image of TB. Master, sorry to disturb you, but I have to report that the Star Forge station has been repaired and is now at 100% operation efficiency, but there is something else, said TB. Okay. Hat is it? It's not anything bad, is it? said Alexander, hoping that it was nothing bad. Not bad, master, but it is something that might hinder your plans, so let me just say it, said TB. After reaching 100% operation efficiency, the station unlocked more knowledge and information about the galaxy that I can access, and while looking through this information, I have found out that the station has a limit on what it can produce in a year, said TB. A limit? Asked Alexander, since he was a little confused, since he thought that station could produce an unlimited amount of ships and war droids. Yes, this year, the station can only produce 20 ships and 1 million droids. Three of the 20 ship slots have already been used, 
and 200k droids of the 1 million allowed has also already been produced, and every year that amount will increase by a set amount of 20 ships and an additional 1 million droids, explained TB. TC, so basically we are limited to the amount of droids and ships we can make. What other war materials? Asked Alexander. There is no limit for those. The only limit is placed on the ships and the droids, said TB. I see, said Alexander as he thought to himself. He figured that the goddess who gave him the station put restrictions on the station so that he won't just conquer the galaxy with the first year. While he was a little mad by the fact that the station was restricted, he actually didn't care that much, since with the droids, he could just use them to build ships, and having one million droids, he could do lots of things. So this limit won't really affect him that much, but it will also require more time to prepare for his expansion into the galaxy. TC, thank you, TB, for informing me about this, said Alexander. No problem, Master. That is my job as your servant, and also regarding the knowledge and information I received. Most of that knowledge is about the unknown regions of that galaxy and the different races and empires that live in it. And I have received knowledge which will help me in developing the AI, which will now take one month. Said T.B. Alexanders raised his eyebrow since he was interested in the knowledge about the unknown regions since he could potentially start expanding into these regions. Send all the information over to my personal data pad so I can look at it. Already did master, and I have already marked potential targets that we could conquer. Good. I'm going to go look at that information, but in the meantime, I want you to use the Star Forge to build more droids and start expanding into the system. Also, I want to start scavenging these shipwrecks that are around the planet and on the planet so that we can use those materials for shipbuilding and other construction projects, said Alexander. T will start preparations immediately. Master, said TB as he ended the transmission. Alexander walked back to his room and started looking over all the information that was on the data pad. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. On the data pad was information of planets and empires in the unknown regions, which were either unknown to the rest of the galaxy, or people have only heard rumors about it. Though the Republic has data and records of some planets and systems, but that information was probably thousands of years old. The first piece of information that was marked by TB was the planet of Orin, which was home to the Orinians. The planet had a surface featuring thick fog and tall mesas and plateaus. The Orinians, while they were originally humans, they eventually evolved into a distinct sentient species of near-humans. The species appeared similar to humans physically, with the exception of orange-hued skin. The planet was colonized after the Great Hyperspace War as a Galactic Republic advance warning outpost based on a self-sufficient military garrison. Eventually, the colonists were stranded and isolated from the rest of the galaxy. Following a coup led by Magnus, the colony's military leader, Orenian society transformed itself into a caste-based military dictatorship devoted to the planet's military buildup under the rule of a leader holding the title of Magnus. Only those who served with Orin's military were granted full citizenship and rights. Over time, the Orinians raided nearby star systems to gain modern military technology. The technology was then analyzed on Orin in order to upgrade the planet's own armaments. TB had marked this as the first and easiest target for conquest, since most likely the Orinians didn't have a proper navy and only had a couple of frigates and lots of fighters, which wouldn't be a problem for them. The second target was the planet of Zakul, which was home to the Zakulan people. Zakul was a backwater planet located within wild space, having possessed almost no contact with the rest of the galaxy due to its position. After the fall of the Eternal Empire, Zakul had separated from the victorious Eternal Alliance and formed their own government called the Zakulan government. The government was formed after the Eternal Alliance lost the Eternal Fleet and the Gravestone citing that the Zakul's population wasn't willing to continue being a member of the Eternal Alliance. After becoming independent, they then tried to establish relations with the core worlds of the galaxy, but Zakul's efforts to establish diplomatic ties with the core worlds proved unsuccessful. 
and the only trading partner they could find was a group of corporations which actually was a massive smuggling organization. Throughout the hundred of years that the Republic remained at peace, Zakul was forgotten by most of the galaxy, and the only records left of them were with the Republic. This would be another planet that Alexander can conquer without too much of a problem. The next target was the Sai Ruvi Imperium, which occupied the planet of Lowek. Lowek was the capital planet of the Sai Ruvi Imperium, located beyond the main disk of the galaxy in the remote Sai Ruk star cluster. The native species of the planet were called Sai Ru. The Sai Ruvi Imperium was the territorial holdings of the Sai Ruvi who reigned over a large swath of the unknown regions known as the Sai Ruk star cluster. The Shreftut, elective monarch of the Sai Ruvi Imperium, ruled from the capital of Luwek and was governed by the Conclave and the Elders' Council. Though at this time, the only planet that they have is one which is their homeworld. The last target, which was also the biggest and most dangerous, was the Chiss Ascendancy. They held lots of systems within the unknown regions and were aware of the things going on elsewhere in the galaxy. They held multiple planets and had a massive fleet, which they only used to defend themselves or in some cases prevent an attack on them from happening. Going through the datapad so far, nothing had as much information about, but when it came down to the Chiss Ascendancy, they had almost five pages of information about them. Alexander only got through two pages, Beff, or he put the data pad down, since it was a lot to take in. He had been on the data pad for four hours, reading all the information that TB sent him. While it was a lot of information, he was glad that he even had it, since now he knows his first planet that he was going to conquer, which was Orin. It would be a good first planet for him to conquer, as it would increase the amount of population that he has, and also increase the available resources that he can mine. He continued to look through the data pad until a droid came and informed him that the droids that went to steal the cloning data have returned. Although he didn't show it on his face, Alexander was celebrating in his mind, since now he can start the production of clones. Chapter 16 Chapter 16 One Month Later after the stealth droids returned after they had had successfully gotten all the data about cloning from the Kaminoans, Alexander had already started building multiple cloning facilities on Lehan, and with the droids building the facilities, they were able to build them much faster. The production of clones wouldn't begin until after the AI was created, since with that, they could drastically improve the DNA of the clones, making them more powerful than the normal clones. Once the AI was completed, Alexander had named it after the best video game AI from his previous life, which was Cortana. Cortana was connected to almost everything in the station and was helping TB with the management of the station. She was also connected with the hundreds of thousands of droids that were in service. To start the cloning process, Cortana wanted to use Alexander's genetic makeup for the basis and then combine it with the genetic makeup of other creatures and humanoids to effectively make a super soldier. To do this, they would need samples from various other races and or creatures that are considered powerful amongst the galaxy. So, various teams of stealth droids were dispatched to different parts of the galaxy to gather these samples. Cortana wanted the clones to grow up faster than normal clones, but also keep them from having the various problems that come with accelerated growth. She wanted them to grow up to the age of adulthood which was 20. Then from there, the age acceleration would become inactive. For now, though, since she was basically just born as an AI, she doesn't have the knowledge of how to do that, but the more she read that data on cloning, the more she understood and closer she came to finding a way. And with no limitations placed on how much she could learn, she estimated that fully mastering the concept of genetic makeup and any other things regarding genetics would take at most two weeks. Alexander was in his room, laying down on his bed with both Urena and Yona on each of his arms. At this moment, they were discussing what they should call his empire. How about Alexander's empire, said Urena. No, I don't want to name my empire after myself, said Alexander, since that would be a little cringe to do. Then how about infinite empire after the ancient Rakata, said Yona. 
No, that would give our empire a bad reputation, since we named ourselves after an empire that enslaved most of the galaxy, and even if it was thousands of years ago, somebody could still use that against us, said Alexander. After listening to Urena and Yona try and come up with a name, Alexander had one in mind. How about the Galactic Imperium? It's different from the Galactic Empire and Galactic Republic. Urena and Yona thought about it before they thought that it was a good name for his empire. And they didn't want to continue discussing a name for his empire, since it was quite a hassle. The next thing that they discussed was what the flag of the Galactic Imperium would look like. Luckily, Alexander already had a flag designed on his datapad, so he just showed them what it was. Flag image here. Meanwhile, the Rakata, who were enjoying their new way of life in the city, had grown from mere savages to a modern galactic civilization despite their small numbers. Speeders could be seen moving through the city, and some Rakata could be seen leaving the training grounds and naval academy that was established. At the academy, they were being taught naval warfare and tactics and learning how to operate ships or how to pilot them. At the training grounds was the place where the Rakata who joined the army were being trained. It was multiple of these training grounds located across the planet, each having Rakata being trained. The majority of the Rakata had joined the military of the Galactic Imperium, but at the moment, there were not a lot of ships available for the amount of Rakata that would soon graduate from the Naval Academy. But Alexander planned to fix that, as he had mining operations set up all across the planet and in the star system. The mined resources were then taken to the shipbuilding stations located above the planet, where the construction of ships was taking place. His mining operations for now were currently just in the system, since he didn't want to invite any unwanted attention from mining outside the system, but once his fleet starts to get more ships, he will start expanding his mining operations to other systems. As for his fleet, it would be comprised of Old Republic ships only, their weapons and other equipment, such as S.H.I.E.L.D., would be from this technology era. Cortana had introduced multiple ships from the Old Republic era, which they could use for the fleet. The first was the Harrower-class Dreadnought, which was used by the Sith Empire. The Harrower-class Dreadnought was a heavily armed class of wedge-shaped capital ship that was the backbone of the Imperial Navy of the reconstituted Sith Empire during the Great Galactic War, the Cold War, and the Galactic War with the Galactic Republic. It measured around 800 meters long, with heavily reinforced hull plating and shield generators. It carried a complement of over 100 starfighters, bombers, and shuttles. A single dreadnought required a crew of 2,400 and could carry 7,300 troops. As of now, Alexander couldn't build a single Harrower-class dreadnought because of the immense amount of resources that it takes, but luckily he can produce 17 more ships using the Starforge, so that's what he did was to make 12 Harrower-class dreadnoughts. As for the remaining five ships, Alexander would use the Secutor-class Star Destroyer, which was a carrier but had the size of a battlecruiser. It was crewed by 40,000 personnel and had enough consumables to last for two years in voyage. It also possessed 15 heavy turbolaser batteries, 15 light turbolasers, 15 battleship-class ion cannon batteries, 16 medium ion cannons, and 12 tractor beam projectors. It could carry 144 fighters, as well as various other small craft, various walkers, and over 14,000 troops. With both of these ships built, Alexander was ready to attack Orin, which would be his second planet that he conquers in the galaxy. Chapter 17 Chapter 17 so the Galactic Imperium is used a lot in Star Wars novels, and I want to make something original. So instead of the Galactic Imperium, I have come up with three names that I will choose from. United Imperial Worlds, Orion Empire, Terran Ascendancy. All three are off of a Star Empire name generator, so if they are cringy, I apologize. And until a new name is chosen, I shall continue to use the Galactic Imperium. Two months later. The droids that were sent out to gather the genetic samples from the powerful creatures and races of the galaxy had returned after a month, and Cortana has successfully combined the genetic codes and created a superhuman genetic code that was vastly superior to normal clones. First, 
the clones will have age acceleration, which will allow them to grow to adulthood within two years. And after they reach adulthood, the age acceleration genetic will be disabled with the use of a chip that will be placed in their head. Unlike the inhibitor chip that caused the clones to betray the Jedi and execute Order 66, this was just a normal chip that will be able to modify the clone's genetic code even after birth. Once the chip disables the age acceleration genetic, then the clones will be able to live like normal humans and have normal growth. Of course, other genetic codes from other races, such as increased strength, increased intelligence, and the Mandalorian genetic codes are also added. With Cortana, the first batch of clones were perfect, with no defects or deformities. The cloning facility was built outside the main city, which he decided to name Arcadia. The cloning lab was a massive facility built to house 100k clones and 10k workers. The 10k workers were all Rakata, who showed high intelligence in cloning technology. Of course, there were other Rakata who were military scientists who looked to further the Imperium's military technology had their own labs as well. And with Cortana, the invention of improved weapons could progress more quickly. In a couple more years or months, once Cortana starts to evolve and learn more, she would probably be able to come up with better weapons for the ships, better shields, basically better everything, since after the Jedi Civil War ended and the Sith were defeated, the technology of the galaxy didn't improve. While some technology was new, some was the same as thousands of years ago. Some technology was even lost throughout the years or became unpopular with the rest of the galaxy. One such technology was energy shields, which had lost favor with armies across the galaxy. Though Alexander doesn't know why they lost favor, since they were very powerful, but listening to Cortana, the energy shields emitted radiation and magnetic fields that were dangerous for sustained use. Alexander asked if this could be fixed or contained to some extent, which Cortana answered, yes. She could either change the way that the shields emit energy which would make the radiation and magnetic fields harmless to those who use, and make it so that it can be used for large amounts of time. But since the process was so complicated, it would take months to actually perfect a new energy shield device. Alexander told Cortana to do whatever it takes, as long as they are able to develop an energy shield that won't affect those that use it. After talking with Cortana about new technology and what things they could use to improve the army, a droid had came in to report, Supreme Commander, we are two minutes from exiting hyperspace into the Orene system. Alexander still had the droids call him Supreme Commander, since hearing a droid calling him Emperor sounded weird to him, so he kept it just Supreme Commander for now. Hearing what the droid said, Alexander stood up and walked to the bridge of the ship. The ship that he was currently on was his personal called the Imperator. It was an improved version of the Secutor class Star Destroyer that had improved turbo lasers and weapons and a better reactor that would emit more power to the ship, increasing the defense, IVE, and offensive abilities of the ship. It was the same for the other ships in the fleet as their designs stayed the same, but the turbo lasers that they had were improved as well as the reactors. Now how did he find a hyperlane that connected to Orene? Well, he had sent droids to discover new hyperlanes that connected to any systems in the unknown regions. This resulted in hundreds of droids getting destroyed in the process, but it was worth it since he didn't want to crash into a star while he tried jumping to the Orene system, and now he has discovered multiple new hyperlanes that connected to various systems surrounding the Rakata system. Anyway, back to Alexander. He had walked into the bridge as the droid admiral informed him that they were about to drop out of hyperspace. He nodded and sat down in his commander's chair. Two minutes later, and they dropped out of hyperspace. Immediately, they started picking up on their sensors nearby ships and fighters that were small compared to his massive ships. He ordered the fleet to launch all their fighters and to send out the broadcast to all the enemy ships. In a frigate, which was commanded by an O'Ren admiral, he had immediately contacted the Central Command to let them know of the massive fleet that just appeared out of nowhere. That's when he heard the broadcast from the enemy ships. All O'Renian ships, this is the Galactic Imperium. 
We are here to conquer this world and bring it under our control. So power off your ships and prepare to be boarded or fight back and get destroyed. The Orenians didn't even need to respond since they opened fire on the Imperium ships. Chapter 18 Chapter 18 So it seems the Terran Ascendancy was the favorite and I. I liked it myself, so for now on his empire will be called the Terran Ascendancy. The Terran fleet didn't even wait after being fired upon as the entire fleet opened fire on the Orenian fleet. The hundreds of fighters had already launched and were fighting with the Orenian fighters. The fighters that the Terran fleet was using were the Nimbus-class V-Wing starfighters. But after a couple of hits, the Orenian frigates didn't last long and were destroyed, but because of their speed, they were able to outmaneuver some of the Terran capital ships. So Alexander sent out the bombers escorted by fighters to put an end to these frigates so they can invade the planet. The battle didn't last long, since the Orenian fleet wasn't that strong. So after half an hour of fighting, the Terran ships had forced the remaining fighters of the Orenians to flee to the planet's surface. Commander, we have taken control of the space around the planet and are now beginning our descent into the planet's surface, said a droid on a hologram. Good, I want this planet captured quickly and any resistance will be put down, said Alexander. The droid bowed as the hollow call ended and Alexander sat down in his commander's chair as he watched the screens which were in front of him. On the screens were the droid dropships descending into the planet, as well as the Harrower-class dreadnoughts. Alexander and his Secutor-class destroyer were too big to descend into the planet's atmosphere, so they remained in space while the other ships went to take control of the planet. The droids that were in the Amphibious Interstellar Assault Transport Dropships, or AIAT for short, were the Mark VI Sentinel droids that were significantly better than the Mark V Sentinel droids. Their armor was better, and they were equipped with a Mark I personal shield, which is currently in the experimental phase of development, and this war would test how effective they are and help see any improvements that need to be made. Along with AIATs were the new and improved Emate, or the Multi Altitude Assault Transport which was similar in design to the LAE, only it has been significantly improved with upgraded weapons and armor, M8 pick. They also had Y-45 armored transport haulers that would drop walkers with the ground troops, Y-45 pick. Escorting the transports were hundreds of V-wing fighters to ensure that all dropships make it to the surface of the planet to land the droids. Meanwhile, on the surface of the planet, at the capital city of Fort Maximus, was a group of people sitting at a table, all looking at the person sitting at the front of the table. This person was the military dictator of the Orenian government, the Magnus. Sir, we have detected the enemy sending in dropships to the surface of the planet. We have already sent fighters to intercept and destroy the enemy dropships, but they are protected by hundreds of fighters and a ton of gunships, making it hard to approach them, said one of the generals. No, General. The enemy forces are too strong. They destroyed our navy within near minutes and have lots of large ships, which if they descend into the planet's atmosphere, we will not last long. Sir, we should surrender and make a deal with enemy, said an admiral. The general slammed his fists on the table. No, you dare suggest we surrender. Admiral, have you forgotten the ways of the Iranian people? Almost every citizen has military training so we can use that to our advantage, and with our superior numbers, we can overpower the invaders and beat their army," said the general. Are you saying that we should arm the civilians to fight against the invaders? No, we cannot do that," said the admiral. Things were getting heated between the general and the admiral before Magnus had got tired of the arguing. Enough, yelled the Magnus, have come to the conclusion that we will arm the civilians but only those who are the most loyal. So, hat we won't arm any hidden rebel groups as we already had a major problem at hand and we don't need more problems to pop up, said the Magnus. All the people at the table stood up and bowed without saying a single word since whatever the Magnus says does not get questioned. After saying his decision, the people left the room to carry out his orders while one particular admiral was not satisfied with what happened. 
so he left to do something that would change the future of the Orenians. Chapter 19 Chapter 19 The Orenian admiral, whose name was Titus Oranius, had gathered those who thought the same way as him and had contacted the invading force to join them and destroy the Magnus. I will use Roman names for the Orenians that I mention in the story. Titus had thought this way for a while now and had worked his way up in rank in order to be voted as the military dictator of the planet in the future and be known as the Magnus. Once he attained the position, he wanted to change the way that the people were ruled and make life better and not force people to have to serve in the military to become a citizen. He worked his way up all the way from the bottom all the way to the rank of admiral and was granted a fleet. He then started expanding his influence and making friends within the higher ranks and also enemies, one of which was the general he got into an argument with earlier. Anyway, he gathered some other high-ranking people who also shared his vision of a better society and had met with them to discuss the future. The meeting didn't last that long, since all the people in attendance agreed that contacting the invading force to discuss some type of deal with them would be beneficial to both parties. But as soon as the meeting finished, their building was stormed by sentinel droids, and the room they were in was swarmed by droids pointing blasters at them, ordering them to put their hands up. They followed the orders of the droids and put their hands up, surrendering. They then told the droids that they wished to meet with their leader. Alexander was already watching what was going on and told the droids to have them escorted up to his ship. The droid took the people outside and requested a transport for them. Once Titus was outside, he had seen a massive ship flying over the building with lots of fighters patrolling around. He also heard faint blaster fire coming from the distance, which he knew was the last resistance of the militia who were fighting. He had also seen some Orenians who had surrendered being taken somewhere by the droids. After a few minutes, a transport ship had showed up and began flying into space towards Alexander's ship, the Imperator. Titus, along with the other high-ranking people, were marveling at the size of the ships that were orbiting the planet. They all looked at each other and were glad that they decided to separate from the government, or else they would probably try to fight back and would lose their lives in a pointless fight. Once the transport landed in the hangar of the Imperator, Titus and the others were escorted out of the transport where they had seen some strange alien which had a humanoid appearance and were green in color. The strange aliens had escorted them to a room on the ship where they were told to wait. Moments later, Alexander came in with Urena and Yona behind him as he sat down at the table. On the other side of the table was five people. Admiral Titus Arrhenius, General Caius Carvilius, Lieutenant Commander Caius Vesalius, Vice Admiral Tertius Rufrius, and finally Commander Tiberius Considius. Alexander had motioned for the droids to hand the Orenians a device. This device was called a universal translator that would allow them to understand each other since Alexander had seen that they spoke another language. The Orenians were looking confused as to what to do with the devices, so Alexander took his off and put it back on his wrist, showing the Orenians what to do. Seeing what he did, they did the same and put the devices on, which made a strange noise before a white light showed, signaling that the devices were on. So now that we can understand each other, my name is Emperor Alexander Hamilton, might change his last name in the future, of the Terran Ascendancy, said Alexander Titus was the first to speak. We appreciate you meeting with us, Your Majesty Alexander. My name is Titus Oranius, an admiral of the Orenian Star Corps. Titus had made sure to speak with respect, since the person in front of him was the one in charge of his fate. We requested to meet with you because before our building was attacked, we were actually having a meeting about joining your side, since we don't like the current government that is ruling the Orenian people. We wish for a better way of life for the Orenian people and have decided to defect and betray the government for better or worse, said Titus as the others nodded, agreeing with what he said. TC, so you don't like the current government and instead decided to support me, a foreign invader. Alexander was testing them to see their reaction, since the same thing could happen in the future. Yes, 
but that is because we know for a fact that you are a better leader for our people, seeing as how you don't kill the innocent, nor do I see you have any slaves. And you even agreed to meet with us when you didn't have to. So based off of those things, we confirmed our decision before you walked in the room, said Titus. Well, you are correct. Your people will live a better life under my rule than they are under the Magnus. That is one of the reasons that I came here. But the main reason is to expand my empire. If your majesty promises that our people will live a better life, then Titus had stood up and bowed just as they bow to the Magnus. I offer my complete loyalty to you, your majesty. Following him were the other four people who did the same thing and swore their loyalty to Alexander. Alexander looked at Yona to see whether or not she sensed that they were telling a lie or had any malicious intent. Yona shook her head, meaning that they were telling the truth, so Alexander accepted their offer of loyalty. He then sent them back to the planet to gather more people who shared their vision of a better life for the Orenian people. Chapter 20 Chapter 20 After talking with the five of them some more, Alexander had sent them down to the planet to gather people who would support them for a better life for the Orenian people. Alexander had even promised that any Orenian who fights against the Magnus will be given immediate citizenship and receive a reward. Naturally, all planets he conquers, the populations will become citizens of the Terran Ascendancy, but they must earn it first by working hard and proving their loyalty. Back on the planet, the majority of the planet was mostly in control of the Ascendancy. I'm going to just start calling it the Ascendancy instead of the whole name to shorten it, with exception to a few locations which proved hard to take, but after conquering a few areas which freed up some droids, Alexander had gathered his forces into three separate locations. From those locations, they will commence a coordinated attack on the capital of the planet, Fort Maximus, which was a strategic location for the defending Orenian military. And they needed to hurry, since they Orenians are also gathering their soldiers to prepare and defend Fort Maximus. Alexander had already ordered fighters to go and intercept them while the three armies commenced their attack. At Fort Maximus, the Orenian soldiers were standing on top the walls of the city, waiting for the enemy to start attacking. Inside the city were the last remaining fighters of the Orenian military. The pilots were resting since they have been fighting for hours now, and they need a break, or else they were going to collapse. But when do they ever get what they want? As the alarms started ringing, and their commander started ordering them to get to their fighters. As they ran outside, they saw three massive capital ships above the sky with fighters flying out of the hangar. And as they were running to get into the cockpits of their fighters, they saw gunships that were escorting transports landing all around the city. By this time, they had already climbed into their fighters and were about to take off in the direction of the Ascendancy fighters. But suddenly, bombers from the Ascendancy capital ship had started bombing the hangar, destroying some of the Orenian fighters and killing the pilots. The commander ordered them to forget about their comrades and go fight the enemy. They were hesitant at first, but nobody wanted to be punished for not obeying orders, so they took off, leaving behind their comrades. But as soon as they exited the hangar, they were shot down by a group of gunships, which landed right in front of the hangar. The doors of the gunships opened as the sentinel droids started shooting inside the hangar. The remaining soldiers in the hangar started exchanging fire with the sentinel droids, but there were too many of them, and they were being overwhelmed. After about half an hour of fighting, the hangar was successfully taken by the droids, as the Orenians inside were either dead or unconscious. One Orenian who was still alive and conscious was listening to the droids who were talking. Hangar number four has been secured, moving on to secondary target, said one of the droids. Good, squads one to seven are engaging the enemy in section two of the city and should be done within a couple of minutes and will meet you at coordinates 173-713 to assault an enemy stronghold. It was the droid commander that was speaking. The Orenian had crawled to a blaster that was near him and grabbed it. He aimed it at the droid and pulled the trigger. 
The blaster shot flew towards the droid and hit it right in its chest area, but a blue-looking force field had appeared and absorbed the blaster shot. The droid walked over to the Orenian and stepped on his hand, causing him to scream in pain. Then the droid aimed its rifle at the screaming Orenian and killed him. After the Orenian was dead, the droid contacted the main command, reporting one more Orenian soldier KIA. Affirmative Unit 11134 proceed to secondary objective. Roger that, said the droid as it left, followed by the other droids, and boarded the gunship outside. The gunship took off and proceeded to another location in the city. Meanwhile, Alexander was on his ship looking at the number of Orenians that were being killed in this war. The numbers were going up every second that went by, as the current count was 837,674. This number didn't phase him at all, since he was sure that in the future, more people would be killed in wars than the number that he is looking at now.